we are live, huh? <laughs> Good evening. Good evening. Oh, how y'all doing tonight? Well, we're running late. My apology. I'm tardy. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, good to be with you. One more Bible study together, huh? Uh, two Bible studies? Oh, okay. Well, we'll just go with it. All right, you guys. We're going to continue our study this evening in the book of Samuel, Second. Second Samuel, so if you want to open your Bibles there, um, we'll get started just since we are running late. I'm going to open us up with a word of prayer while you're turning to that, and we can get started. <laughs> Heavenly Father, we want to give you thanks tonight for your word. Thank you, Father, that we have this time together uh, to continue to study uh, about David and his life, and uh, we want to thank you, Lord, for... Uh, your Holy Spirit that speaks to us and, and teaches us. Lord, we want to glean uh, those nuggets of truth that you have for us this evening in your word, that you, the things that you want to speak to our hearts, Lord. And so we just ask your blessing upon our, on our study tonight, and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, you guys. So last time we were together, um, we read about Absalom. And uh, Absalom's vengeful murder of his brother. Um, and do you remember why he murdered his brother? Because he raped, raped his half-sister. And Absalom thought that maybe it was his job to carry out vengeance on Amnon. And so he murdered Amnon. One of the things that we saw as we ended the chapter was that word got out that something horrible had happened and uh, the king, King David, got word that all of his children had been murdered. And uh, as we closed out that chapter, we found that uh, it was only Amnon that was murdered. The rest of the sons ran away in fear. And then, uh, of course, after Absalom had been discovered as the uh, perpetrator of the crime, Absalom, he ran away and uh, went into hiding. Uh, verse 37 of chapter 13 tells us that he went to Talmai, the son of Ahimahud, and uh, Absalom hung out in uh, Gesher there, with, uh, where he was in exile, if you will, for three years. So between chapter 13... And chapter 14, you have a three-year period of time that has gone by. And uh, amazing to me as we read that closing verse in chapter 13, how David longed for Absalom. Even though Absalom had done what he had done, uh, David had mourned over his son that was murdered. And uh, now after three years... David's heart has begun to soften towards his son Absalom. And it tells us in verse 39 of chapter 13 that he longed for Absalom. Um, and so as we pick up in chapter 14, it says that Joab, Joab, you remember, was the commander, David's commander of the armies. Joab, the son of Zer Zeruiah, perceived that the king's heart was concerned about Absalom. So Joab sent to Tekoa and brought from there a wise woman. And he said to her, Please pretend to be a mourner and put on mourning apparel. Do not anoint yourself with oil, but act like a woman who has been mourning for a long time for the dead. And go to the king. And speak to him in this manner. So Joab put the words in her mouth. And when the woman of Tekoa spoke to the king, she fell on her face to the ground and prostrated herself and said, Help, O king. 
And then the king said to her, What troubles you? And she answered and said, Indeed, I am a widow, and my husband is dead. Now, your maidservant, speaking of herself, of course, your maidservant had two sons. And the two fought with each other in the field. And there was no one to part them. But the one struck the other and killed him. And now the whole family has risen up against your maidservant. And they said, Deliver him who struck his brother, that we may execute him for the life of his brother whom he killed. And we will destroy the heir also. And so they would extinguish my ember that is left, and leave to my husband neither name or remnant on earth. So after this time has gone by and David's heart is beginning to long for Absalom, um, Joab comes up with this plan to send this woman. Now you might remember when, uh, when David fell into sin with Bathsheba um, that the prophet Nathan went to David and told the story about um, the king's neighbor, the rich man who, you know, took his neighbor's lamb and cooked it up for lunch for some guests that he had coming. And that whole story um, that he told David was designed to expose David. It was designed to fire David up. Um, and you might remember David said, I don't know who that guy is, but he shall surely die. Well, we remember now that the prophet told David, well, you're the guy. That's what you did. You, you took Uriah's little lamb and you slaughtered her, in a sense, when you could have had any lamb you want, but you took her and now you're busted, now you're exposed. Your sin has found you out. This is a thing that the Bible is very consistent about when it teaches us that you can count on one thing. Your sin will find you out. One way or another, it's going to find you out. Now, could those sins perhaps be kept a secret? Yeah, but that doesn't mean your sin won't find you out. You may have to live with misery. You may have to live with depression. You may have to live with guilt for the rest of your life. But whenever we do something against God like that, a major act of defiance like what David did, and then cover it up and act like it didn't happen, in one way or another, it's either going to be exposed to people or it's going to eat us inside. It's going to rot us from the inside out. And so the prophet had told David that this is what was going to happen. You're busted, David. Well, now here, years down the road, we have a very similar um, strategy here by Joab um, concerning this particular problem with Absalom. David does not want to see Absalom. He loves Absalom, but he's committed a horrible crime. And we're going to see here that David, um, as the story goes along, Absalom is still going to be banned from the palace as we go through here. So the woman that Joab sends comes with a story, her story, and you might have noticed already, is directly related to David's problem once again. So the lady is telling him that the people want the mother to deliver this murderous son to them so that he could be executed. And she doesn't want this to happen because this is her only two sons. If he's executed, then her husband's ember, if you will, I like the way they put that, that would extinguish my ember that is left and leave to my husband neither name or remembrance on earth. It's a very important thing to have sons because one thing sons do is they carry on your name. They carry on the lineage of the family. Um, I, you know, I, I, I personally, I have two sons um, in, that, are, that are in my family 
but all the rest of my siblings in my family have no sons. So my two, grand, my two sons are the only lineage I have that will carry on my name. If I didn't have them, then my name would die when I die. Because, you know, the women get married, they change their name, they come into another family. And so this woman is coming to the king, uh, putting on this act. It's a story. Joab put words in her mouth, rehearsed it with her, and actually had her uh, disguise herself uh, to come before the king. Interesting to me that even the king would even have, would give her audience. So uh, it, it, it still speaks a lot about David, this, this very, very troubled woman coming to the king, falling on her face, crying out for help, and David's heart uh, is softened towards her and wants to know what is troubling her so much. And so in verse 8, after she tells her story, the king said to the woman, Go to your house, and I will give orders concerning you. And so the woman of Tekoa said to the king, My lord the king, let the iniquity be on me and on my father's house, and the king and his throne be guiltless. I don't want you to step out beyond your reasonable ability. I don't want your name to be tarnished uh, because of this incident. So however it pans out, I will take the blame so that you, as the king, uh, will not be uh, held guilty for, for any of this. So the king said, and this was his answer to her, whoever says anything to you, bring him to me and he shall not touch you anymore. If anybody messes with you, they're messing with me. Bring him to me, David said, and I'll deal with it. And she said, please let the king remember the Lord your God, and do not permit the avenger of blood to destroy any more, lest they destroy my son. And he said, as the Lord lives, not one hair of your son shall fall to the ground. Now, David doesn't know it, but he's actually speaking of his own child here. So, did you know that um, in Israel, <coughs> in their justice system, there were cities that were established in Israel, communities, and they were called cities of refuge. So, um, Let's say today you were intoxicated and you were driving a vehicle and you hit somebody and you took their life. You didn't do it on purpose. You didn't do it with malice. You didn't go out and intentionally bring harm to them. Now, if something like this would have happened in the time of David in Israel, that person who would have... Well, even if they would have gotten like in a fight or something and he accidentally killed his opponent, but he didn't mean to kill the opponent, they would be sent to a city of refuge because the law demanded if you kill, then you should be killed. But an accidental death, we would call it manslaughter today, if you will. Um, they had these cities of refuge that these people could run to because according to the law, the families had the right to seek vengeance on the person who took their loved one's life, accident or not. So they would send them to the city of refuge, and they were told, you'll be safe here. Now, if you ever leave, you're on your own. If you ever try to return home again, you're taking the risk of that family coming and seeking out vengeance uh, on you. And this is what the woman of Tekoa is referring to here um, when, when she talks about the avengers of blood. She did not, she's telling David, I'm afraid that the avengers of blood are going to go destroy my son. And of course, David now makes a promise to this woman um, that her son will be safe. So the woman said, 
in verse 12, Please let your maid servant speak another word to my lord the king. And he said, Say on. So the woman said, <laughs> The woman said, Why then have you schemed such a thing against the people of God? For the king speaks this thing as one who is guilty, in that the king does not bring his banished one home again. You're willing to protect my son for what he did in murdering my other son, but yet you have banished your son for murdering your other son. So you're doing the exact opposite of what you're telling me that you'll do for me. Why is that? Why won't you forgive him, basically? She's trying to get him to see things in a different light here. For the king speaks this thing as one who is guilty, in that the king does not bring his banished one home again. For we will surely die and become like water spilt on the ground, which cannot be gathered up again. Yet God does not take away a life, but he devises means so that his banished ones are not expelled from him. Speaking, of course, of the city of refuge here. And she's speaking of something here that's very deep when you look at it. Um, our lives are like water. They fall to the ground. They cannot be gathered up again. Once it's over, it's over. There's no starting over. There's no going back. And she's trying to remind David, this is your shot. If you don't do something, you're going to live the rest of your life regretting it. You need to reconcile with your son, with Absalom. Verse 15, now therefore... I have come to speak of this thing to my lord the king because the people have made me afraid. And your maidservant said, I will now speak to the king. It may be that the king will perform the request of his maidservant. For the king will hear and deliver his maidservant from the hand of the man who would destroy me and my son together from the inheritance of God. Your maidservant said, The word of my lord the king will now be comforting. For as the angel of God, so is my lord the king in discerning good and evil. And may the Lord your God be with you. She's saying, You're a very wise man, David. And I'm sure that you can see where I'm going with this. You can see why I'm using this example because you need to apply this to your own family. And you're very wise. And she's saying, I pray that God would give you discernment. Pray that God would give you insight as to your decision now concerning your son Absalom. And again, remember, this is several years down the road. Now, this part's pretty interesting to me. The king answered and said to the woman, Please do not hide from me anything that I ask you. And the woman said, Please let my lord the king speak. <laughs> and so the king said, Is the hand of Joab with you in all of this? Huh? And the woman had said, As you live, my lord the king, no one can turn to the right hand or to the left from anything that my lord the king has spoken. For your servant Joab commanded me. And he put all of these words in the mouth of your maid servant. Why? To bring about this change of affairs, your servant Joab has done this thing. But my lord is wise according to the wisdom of the angel of God to know everything that is in the earth. Joab did this, David, because he loves you. Joab did this because he knows you still love Absalom. He knows that you long for Absalom. He knows that 
you've probably, and we talked about this um, on several occasions, you probably weren't, you weren't going to receive the Father of the Year award. You didn't raise your family very well. You neglected your sons. They grew up. They have problems. And, and this is what happens. And this is your fault because, you know, of the judgment that was pronounced on your family because of what you did to Uriah and to his wife. These are all consequences of your sin, David. But now, even so, David, you have an opportunity here to salvage this relationship. And Joab was doing it because he cares about you. He loves you. And so the king said to Joab, All right, (laughs) you win, right? I have granted this thing. So go, therefore, and bring back the young man, Absalom. So Joab fell to the ground on his face, and he bowed himself, and he thanked the king. And Joab said, Today your servant knows that I have found favor in your sight, my lord, O king, in that the king has fulfilled the request of his servant. So Joab arose, and he went to Geshur, and he brought Absalom to Jerusalem. Was that the lid on that? Oh. Hmm. Interesting. Somebody hiding in there or something? Or? Yeah. <laughs> Woke you up, huh? All right. So verse 24, the king said, Let him return to his own house, but do not let him see my face. So Absalom returned to his own house and did not see the king's face. So there's kind of a compromise here. He's given Absalom a chance to come home. So in verse 25, it says, Now in all of Israel, there was no one who was praised as much as Absalom. For his good looks. From the sole of his foot to the crown of his head, there was no blemish in him. And when he cut the hair of his head, at the end of every year he would cut it because it was heavy on him. And when he cut it, he weighed the hair of his head 200 shekels, according to the king's standard. 200 shekels comes out to about five pounds. That's a lot of hair. That's a lot yearly, every year. This guy's part sheep or something, I don't know. But literally, um, one of the other translations says, he not just did not just cut his hair, he shaved his head every year. And when he would shave his head every year, he would accumulate five pounds of hair. Why did they put that in here? We don't have a clue. Except to tell us that Absalom um, was a very special individual. Very handsome. Tall and handsome. Maybe even without hair. Who knows? Um, But he was handsome from the crown of the bottom of his feet to the top of his head. He had no blemish. He was a pretty boy. And he was very, very popular with the people. They liked him a lot. Perhaps that's why David was so fond of Absalom, because on the outside, he was a lot like Saul. Remember King Saul? Saul stood head and shoulders above everybody else. And on the outside, he seemed like the perfect candidate to be king, until we found out what he was really like, you know, on the inside. And we're going to see the same kind of a thing uh, unfold with our friend Absalom here. So, verse 27, To Absalom were born three sons and one daughter, whose name was Tamar. And she was a woman of beautiful appearance, took after her dad. 
And Absalom dwelt two full years in Jerusalem, but did not see the king's face after two years. So now we're looking five years after the murder of Amnon. So Absalom sent for Joab and sent Joab to the king, but he would not come to him. And so, this is really weird. And so when he sent again the second time, Joab still would not come to him. And so he said to his servants, See, Joab's field is near mine, and he has barley there. So go and set it on fire. So Absalom's servants set the field on fire. And then Joab arose and came to Absalom's house and said, Why have your servants set my field on fire? Absalom answered Job, Joab, and he said, Look, I sent to you, saying, Come here, that I may send you to the king to say, Why have I come from Geshur? It would have been better for me to just still be there. Now, therefore, let me see the king's face. But if there is iniquity in me, then let him execute me. So Joab went to the king, and he told him. And when he had called for Absalom, he came to the king. And he bowed himself on his face to the ground before the king. And then the king kissed Absalom. So, a little bit of advice. If you're trying to get someone's attention, don't go burn down their field. Right? This is what he's trying to do. He's the king's son. Even though he's banished, he's still the king's son. He still feels as though he has a lot of authority and, you know, Joab should be paying attention to him. And so he gets his attention by setting his crops on fire. Right? Pretty crazy. How's our time looking, guys? Huh? Ten minutes. Okay. Well, we'll just see how far we get. <clears throat> so Absalom is able now to come into the presence of the king and David kisses him. You would think now that they're going to live happily ever after with one another, right? In perfect harmony. But we're going to find out that Absalom has a pride problem. Absalom has an agenda. He's very, very bitter towards his father, David. Even though he's the favored son, he has a problem with his dad. And there's probably a myriad of reasons um, that Absalom has this struggle with his father. There's a lot of unforgiveness floating around there, huh? There's a lot of vengeance and bitterness floating around in this family. And, you know, as Absalom makes his case to Joab, um, he's pretty much saying, you know what, I'm fed up with this whole thing. I'm tired of playing this game. If I've done something wrong, then kill me. You know, I'd have been better off staying in, you know, in Gesher. I was safe there. I had a life there. But yet I came home thinking that I was going to be restored to my father. And of course, that's not the way things are working out. So, doggone it, let's just get on with it and finish it up. Now, do you think Absalom really wants to be executed? No. He's playing on David's emotion. He's manipulating David's emotions towards his favorite son. So he knows that he's using this strategy to get back into David's graces once again. Now, this is a really good picture um, of how the evil one betrays us. You know, the Bible tells us that he comes as an angel of light. Satan does. That he can, well, he is an angel of light. He was the shining one. 
That's what is really his name. He was one of the shining ones. He was uh, among the same group uh, as uh, Gabriel. Uh, he was one of the chief archangels. He was very, very powerful in heaven. Uh, and by the way, uh, Moroni wasn't there, if you ever wonder. Um, you know, he, he's in another book, Moroni, but he's not in the Bible. So, um, you know, I think Moroni was actually Lucifer, um, posing as an angel of light, deceiving a man in uh, New Jersey, New York, and uh, who started a church. And the church has become one of the largest churches in the world. And it's called the Mormon Church. And supposedly Moroni is the guy who God sent to Joe to tell Joe, I don't like any of these Christians. I don't like any of these churches. They're an abomination. So Joe, I'm going to use you to establish a real church on the earth. This will be the true church. The church of the Latter-day Saints, the Mormons. Very powerful. Someone's going to hear this and be angry at me, and I'm not apologizing. Because a lie is a lie. A cult is a cult. An impersonator is an impersonator. And the very same thing that Absalom's doing here is the very same tactic that Satan has been using from day one. He appears as an angel of light. He appears as an ally. He appears as a representative of the king, if you will. But he has another agenda. As a matter of fact, he has an agenda of destruction of the king so that he himself might eventually sit on that throne. You know that's what Satan's trying to do. He's, well, he's doing it. He's literally usurping the throne of this world, which truly does belong to Jesus. But he's usurped that throne, and he's in complete control of the affairs of this world. It's because of him that we're living in the times that we're living in right now. Now, I've always asked this question. I've always wondered. I've always thought, you know, Lord, you are God. You're bigger than the deceiver. Why can't you just snuff him out and let's get on with it? Well, I'm thankful tonight that my plan isn't his plan. I'm thankful tonight that I'm not his counselor. I'm thankful tonight that he has everything well in hand. Yeah, he might be usurping the throne. He might be called the God of this world, the Prince of Darkness, all of those beautiful titles that he has. But, but why doesn't God just wipe it out and take care of all evil 2,000 years ago and be done with it and we're all living in the kingdom age today? Well, because he has a plan. And because God is a just God. He's a merciful God. It's not His will that any should perish, but that we should all come to repentance, come to a, a relationship with the true living God, which you and I enjoy in our lives. But the sense of justice, the sense of saying, well, you know, the children of Israel left Egypt. They got out there and Mo, Mo went up on the mountain to get the, the law. And while Mo was gone, what'd they do? They started worshiping a false god. They made what? They made a golden calf, cow, a bull, if you will. And uh, the bull represented pleasure. The bull represented prosperity of the things of the world, the, the desires of the flesh. It represented all of those things. It was a false god. 
How am I going to do this? So I was watching the news this morning, <laughs> and they were talking about these banks that are failing and all the trouble that we're in financially in our country, in the world. And they were talking about Wall Street, and they were talking about all the, the big money and, and all this kind of stuff. And they showed this image that's down there by Wall Street. And it is a golden bull. It's the very same idol that the children of Israel made when Moses went up to get the law. Identical. Now, we look at it and we go, that's because we're bullish. That's because we're a country of prosperity and that's what it represents. Well, don't you think it's kind of interesting that that system of the bull, the golden calf, whatever you want to call it, how it fails over and over and over again, and it will never, ever truly bring prosperity uh, to our country, that it's an idol, just like what they built at the foot of the mountain there when, when Moses was up on the mountain? Is there a correlation there? I think so. I think what we're seeing right now, what we're seeing right here, we're seeing a repeat of the same play being given in a different context over and over and over again. Absalom is still alive and well. He's still out there prowling around and he's still out there scheming and he's a really good looking fella. He attracts people. He causes people to be drawn to him. And we're going to see next week that he leads the whole nation of Israel astray and turns against, they turn against God's anointed one, who was David. We're going to see that happen. Because I'll tell you one thing, we, we're going to, we'll park it right there for now. We, um, we sometimes think that the devil's winning. We sometimes think that what can our strategy be? How can we come against this? Do you know that his strategy hasn't changed in thousands of years? He's limited as to what he can do to, to deceive humanity. He has three things to work on. Three tools that he uses. He has the lust of the eyes. He has the lust of the flesh. And he has the pride of life. That's all he's got. He went to Eve with that and Eve fell for it. She looked at the tree and it was pleasing to look at the lust of the eyes. And then he appealed to the lust of the flesh when he said, it's good food too. And he appealed to the pride of life when he said, it will make you like God, knowing good and evil. Those are the very three things that he used to deceive her in the garden. Thousands of years down the road, there's a man out in the wilderness, and he's just been baptized. And a dove has come down and landed upon him, and now he's in the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights. And who comes along? Absalom, in a sense. And what does Absalom do? What does Satan do? He uses the very exact same three things to try to take down Jesus. He starts off with hunger, my flesh, right? Then he goes with the lust of the eyes. I will give you every kingdom in the world if you'll just bend down and worship me. And then he does the pride of life. He says, hey, why don't you go up to the highest pinnacle of the temple? right in front of everybody, and just do a swan dive off of that thing. And they'll watch you gently light to the ground, and they'll all come and they'll worship you. You're going to be the number one hero of the world if you do that. The pride of life. Now, I know that. Those are his tactics. And because I know those are his tactics, 
I have a strategy for battle. I have a strategy to know to look out for those three things coming to me to try to take me down. And believe it or not, he doesn't have all power uh, against us. He's li- God has limited him. He's not all powerful. You know, when you hear people say, the devil made me do it. That's stupid. The devil didn't make me do it. I fell for the lie and allowed that to happen. So Absalom, Satan in the garden, so many men all the way down through history. Same agenda, same strategy, same game plan. So here we are today, living in this world, where we're actually seeing this unfold in a very, very powerful way. So I'm going to go home tonight, and I'm going to say, I'm going to be on the lookout for Absalom. When I get up in the morning, I'm going to wake up and I'm going to know he's out there prowling around. He's going to come at me with the very same things that he's come at mankind with since the beginning of history. But the Bible tells us we don't have to be ignorant of his schemes. That's what the Bible says. I don't have to be ignorant of his devices. I already know what his strategy is. I already know what his game plan is. Which gives you and me tonight an advantage over him. He can't take us by surprise, you guys. We just need to be on the lookout. We need to be watching because we're living in a time right now where things are wrapping up. It's not the end of the world. It's just that God is about fed up with allowing man to ruin his creation and he's going to repo it. He's taken it back for himself. It's not the end of the world. It's going to be the ushering in of a new world. Right? The way God originally intended that to be. That's where we are tonight. So that's why it's important for me talking to you about these things, that we're not just looking at this as some really cool story in the Bible, isn't it? No, it's much more than that. There's stuff in here that give me instructions on how I need to live my life. It gives me a strategy to know how to be on the lookout for the wiles of the devil. And to know that tonight he has nothing in me or you. We belong to God. We belong to Jesus. We've been bought and paid for. We are his prized possession. Right? That's what I want you to go out of here with tonight. Knowing that. I think it's great that we're living in the times that we're living in. It's not easy. It's very heartbreaking to see the depravity and the sickness of the world. But at the same time, it's encouraging to know that, like Jesus said, these things must come to pass. And then the end. It has to happen this way. God's not on vacation. He hasn't forsaken us. And I do believe that it's wrapping up right before our very eyes. Now, will we all be uh, walking the planet and breathing oxygen when that trumpet blows and the bride goes up to be with the groom? I hope so. Right? We all want to experience that. You know, the Bible tells us some of us, if we live through that, we won't taste death. We won't die. We'll just, boom, be changed. That sounds pretty good to me. Right? But at the same time, here's the other side of that coin. How many of our loved ones? How many people are there that we know that we still want to see them come to Jesus? And we know that when the bride is removed, the Holy Spirit goes with the bride and all hell is going to break loose on this earth. There will be no more restrainer. When we're gone, He'll go with us. And those that we know that don't know God, 
it's going to be next to, I won't say impossible, but it's going to be very, very difficult for them to come around. So while, yes, I want to go, I'm ready, Lord, but at the same time, if I have to wait three generations to see more people come to Christ, I think it's worth it, right? Let's pray. Father, um, Lord, I know I, I, I get off on these little tangents, and, uh, but God, I just trust that the things that we've talked about tonight would, would truly encourage us, Lord, and uh, keep our eyes open to the truth. God, we, I just confess, Lord, I, I, I take the most minute little issues and I try to blow them up into catastrophic things when they're really nothing. They're, they're just small little things and so much more important things to be focused on. So many more things that God to do your will, to follow your plan. And help us, Lord, not to be distracted because that's what this is. It's a, it's a giant ploy to distract people from you and from your plan and from your love. But Lord, we want to be the children of light. We don't want to be children of darkness. We don't want to be flailing around out there with no direction. We want to know, Lord, that you're coming soon. We want to be aware of the signs of the times. And we are rejoicing, Lord, in our hearts that we perhaps might be that generation to see it happen. But nevertheless, Lord, your will be done in our lives. Help us, Lord, to live in that way. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.